Okay, um, so today it is September 6th, 2017, and we are working in class on creating soapstone statements for rhetorical analysis. Um, I know that a sophomore year, your teachers should have taken you through the soapstone tool for analyzing writing, and we all remember, I'm sure, <laughs> that the S in soapstone stands for speaker, the O stands for occasion, the A for audience, the P for purpose, the S for subject, and the T is tone. So what I'm going to be talking to you about today is how to take that basic idea of soapstone to help create a clear divisio, aka a thesis statement, for a rhetorical analysis paper, like major paper one, or also for timed writings, like rhetorical analysis that you're going to encounter on the AP exam. So we're going to take ba the basic concept of soapstone and apply it to creating a statement. Okay, now I'm not a big fan of templates, and in high school I was never a big fan of templates for doing things because I was kind of a creative thinker and I wanted to go my own way. Um, so I'm giving you this template as a way to get you started on this, but that doesn't necessarily mean that this has to be the exact way that you always state your soapstone statement. There are other ways that you can do this, but this is one that we can use as a starting point. So this is the template. In his or her blank, 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 uses employees blank, blank, and blank to blank his audience of blank that blank. Right, that's really clear, isn't it? Okay, so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be filling in the different aspects of soapstone into this template. So the first two blanks here are for the occasion portion of the soapstone. And if you take a look at the sheet on the soapstone um, analysis that I gave you in class, you will see that there are two items that make up the occasion. The first one is the time period, and the second one is the form of the writing. So if we're talking about Mike Rose's I Just Want to Be Average, which we're going to discuss today, we put the year here, and the year that that was published from his book Lives on the Boundary was 1989. So in his 1989... And then here we put the form or the genre of writing. So in this case, it was an excerpt from a memoir. So we're going to go with the memoir and instead of the excerpt. So we have in his 1989 memoir, Lives on the Boundary, which is where that came from. This blank right here is for audience, or not audience, excuse me, speaker. And speaker is really easy for nonfiction writing most of the time. Um, that's simply the author. So here's Mike Rose, goes right here. And then these three blanks right here are for that rhetorical analysis, the idea of tone. So here you have to find two or three strategies um, or main ideas that you're going to be rhetorically analyzing in the paper, the time write, or the major paper. So for example, in class today, we discussed the fact that he uses narrative mode. Basically, he's telling a story. So we're going to use narrative mode right there. Then we talked about how he uses engaging dialogue, because he could tell a story without dialogue, but the dialogue has a really connotative, interesting connotative effect um, on how we feel about these characters and the people in the book, or in the essay that we read. And then the third thing that people came up with in class today was descriptive imagery. So those three things they thought were the most impactful of this particular piece. So now we have, in his or her 1989 memoir, Lives on the Boundary, Mike Rose employs the narrative mode, engaging dialogue, and descriptive imagery. Okay, now we get to this. This blank right here is for like a general purpose statement. And that leads us to the three reasons anyone writes or speaks anything. And they are to inform, to persuade, 
or to entertain. Now, all good writing is a combination of all three of those things. In some cases, when we're trying to persuade someone, we have to inform them of something first. Sometimes we have to entertain them. Sometimes our entertainment is a form of persuasion. Sometimes our persuasion is a form of entertainment. But what you have to do is you have to boil down the piece to its very essence. Like, is the real purpose to inform, to entertain, or to persuade? Even if it does all three, what's the main idea? And so the class today determined that Mike Rose was attempting to persuade. So he wrote persuade here. Now we have to determine, right here, specific audience. So who are the specific people that this piece is being written for? Now you could argue that there are a lot of different audiences that kind of go along with Mike Rose's I Just Want to Be Average. Kids came up with um, American high school students, both honors and remedial students. They discussed the fact that it could be written for administrators or teachers in the public and private school system. And then they finally discussed that, well, maybe it could be also written for lawmakers, the people who um, decide what happens in a classroom in the American public school system. So we're going to take one of those and we're just going to go with the lawmakers, educational lawmakers. Um, because they're the ones that are the ones that should push the change, I guess, um, the students decided today. So we're going to do a, an audience of educational law makers. And then here is our specific purpose or message. What does he want to persuade lawmakers to do or to believe? So today we came up with a simple statement that he wanted them to basically look at how the American educational system was run and decide to change that system in order to better meet the needs of students in remedial level classes in particular, basically making the standards higher for those students. Okay, so if we look at this whole statement, the entire Soapstone statement reads, in his 1989 memoir, Lives on the Boundary, Mike Rose employs the narrative mode, engaging dialogue, and descriptive imagery to persuade his audience of educational lawmakers that the educational system should be changed in order to make higher standards for students enrolled in remedial classes. All right, so that's the basic gist as far as the statement is concerned the soapstone statement. So when you are assigned to do a soapstone statement for readings that we do in the future, this is the template that you should think of first. You can do whatever you want creatively to change this up so you're not following this like fill in the blank sort of idea, but I wanted to give you a really concrete example of how this is put together. And you can hear when I read that statement out that it's a really specific thesis statement that in some cases your um, major paper ones were kind of lacking in. So tonight I want you to do two things. I want you to do a soapstone statement for the next in-class reading, which we talked about today in class, Who Invented White People on page 96 of the Thompson Reader. And I want you to look back at your major paper one divisio slash thesis statements and make those so that they fit better this idea of including all of the elements of what we're looking for in a rhetorical analysis through soapstone. All right, thanks so much.